I have the sincere pleasure today of gathering all of the documents that my accountant needs to do my taxes for 2020. So thank you for giving me a break from all of that to shoot this. Do this. What's up, folks? This is another Ask JK video. My name is Justin Kana. You folks submitted some questions. Everybody upvoted the ones that were their favorites, and I'm just going to go through them one by one. Thanks to everybody that submitted, and I did a wedding photo uh, as the community post here, and everybody gave such great wishes for Anna and I's uh, big day, so thank you for everybody that supported that. For some reason as well, YouTube isn't sorting these by most liked, so I'm just going to go through them top to bottom as how they're showing up, and I left a little heart uh, from me next to the ones that I'm picking to cover today, so if you want to see if yours got covered or not, that's how you know. Gorilla Radio asks, how can you tell apart a restaurant which is actually high-class cuisine and one which is just expensive? Are there any obvious signs to look out for as someone who hasn't had that much experience in fine dining? What comes to mind for me and something that I don't think gets talked about enough, and I had a culinary school teacher that taught us this, is these kind of more, less price related things that Michelin looks at when they're evaluating a restaurant. And those that you can keep in mind as you're looking at a restaurant is like the pedigree of the chef using rare and exotic ingredients. There's something about like the service level uh, and the example that she gave in our class, which I found was really, really helpful was she went to this restaurant in Paris and as she sat down in her chair, when she went to go put her purse down, someone came next to her with like a little stool, like a little Ottoman style thing for her purse. Like, so her purse didn't have to sit on the ground. And for her, that was like total mind blown moment. And so as you're thinking about those things, it doesn't always come down to the food or the price on the menu. There are these other things that kind of go into a high class, uh, fine dining experience more so than just those factors. I would also add, we don't see it as much now because a lot of chefs have moved on from this, but I certainly lived through the age of kind of like molecular gastronomy, modernist cuisine, putting as many components on the plate as possible. And I think there's this difficult to articulate, but you know it when you see it kind of thing of of simple done well. You can zoom out and see it too, where people will do like courses and courses on courses, you know, like as many courses as you can get, that actually helps justify the price for some reason, but I don't always follow that logic. So don't think that more always means better in these experiences. My man Sashin asks, the pandemic is transforming the hospitality, especially the restaurant sector, moving more towards private dining. Do you have any tips for hosting your own events, especially dinner parties, to make the transition easier from restaurant life to essentially catering for your guests? guests. I'm going to give two pieces here, and depending on your personality type, you might fall into one bucket or the other. So I'm going to call to light the episode I did with Max Shapiro, where he talks about the fact that for all of his dinners, he curates the entire guest list. And so if you're that kind of super connector in your community, you can pick different individuals to invite them to a dinner party. My business partner and I do that a lot. You're providing this kind of secondary value through networking and getting to meet interesting people outside of just the food that you're going to prepare. The other bucket and the one that I predict is going to see a huge surge in popularity popularity as things kind of like start to open up again is this idea of I'm hosting this thing already, but I need the food to be fantastic. And you can then partner with that, whether it's a team, whether it's a family, whether it's, you know, a bunch of friends that just want to get together and you can then offer those services to um, make it so that the gathering is already happening. You don't have to worry about, oh, how many guests am I going to are going to be there? How many tickets do I need to sell? It's also kind of like a little it feels a little bit safer for the guests if they know who, who's going to be there. So think through how can you play a few chess moves? moves ahead and be perfectly positioned to take advantage of those opportunities. This question comes from Steve Stevenson. As we move into the new year with the COVID pandemic underway and restaurants not looking to hire, what's the best way for a young chef to still get themselves out there and make progress despite the time? Shout out to everybody that chimed in in the comments to help Steve. It's honestly the worst and I hate that I'm having to tease it, but I'm working on a course and I want it to be something that you can use to either, you know, catapult yourself into your next position or take it in conjunction with, you know, culinary school or if you're staging right now. It's not ready yet. It's going to be ready in, I'm hoping like the next month, two months. But I'm going to default into this more stoic way of thinking about this. You can't control what's happening with the pandemic, but you can control how you're going to respond to the situation. So how can you network more online? How can you, you know, bust out a few cookbooks that might be on your shelf? That's like, I've never actually cooked anything from this cookbook before. Try that out. 
I'm also a big fan of seeing people do these very like low stakes ways to cook for people that, you know, pushes them beyond where their comfort zone is. And Anna and I were actually talking about this the other night when I, I said it in a live stream the other day where I think that if someone were to kind of like do 40 meals and deliver them to like my, uh, I, my dad is in a nursing home right now. And so delivering them, them there, she suggested, and it's even better that you could do it to like frontline healthcare workers. And if you can kind of, you're, you're only used to doing, you know, X number of plates or you want to, you know, elevate it with a couple more components on that or make a really interesting sauce that you've never made before. And it's more or less implied that the receiving end of your generosity is going to be appreciative of what you did. That's kind of a win-win, you know what I mean? On top of that, I'm working on a reps for pastry exclusively. So that might, you know, for some of you people that are just in culinary and you want to kind of build out that skill set, that might be helpful. And then I'm also doing one for plating because I know that that's a question I get a ton of is how do I plate faster? How do I get these techniques as part of my repertoire? So three out of those is more or less coming soon. But the things that you can do now is like form some digital relationships online, email those people, send them DMs, like expand your networks. Practice with the two reps videos that I've already shown or maybe create your own routine that you want to kind of it more jives with the prep list you've had at previous jobs or flex that business development muscle a little bit reach out to like a hospital and say hey would you be willing to sponsor you know 40 meals if I do them for your nurses next week that way you get to have the cooking experience and it's not at any expense to you you're actually doing some good for your community Da Ashman asks, beyond excellent knife skills, what are the fundamentals a beginner chef should master to make the move into fine dining as successful as possible? Reasons I'm creating this course. It's exactly up my alley. I'm very much so in the camp that the recipes change per restaurant, the knife cuts that you're required to do change per restaurant, and even per station. But what are the things that don't change? This is like mindset, the habits that you bring into a, a, your working life, the organization systems that you use, not just in your head, but like on paper. And how do you talk to people in the kitchen? I'm not just going to tease this. I'm actually going to go in and read off some of the things that are part of the modules that I'm creating for this course. It's called the Demi Skills course. It's launching soon. And we're going to go through things like instruction following, station setup. Uh, we're going to talk about knife skills, heat control, task workflow, habit formation, behavior change, kitchen station and confidence, team slash project management. And then I'm actually going to have a five-day kitchen productivity challenge that's going to be free. Anybody can take it and you can see how my teaching style and the things that I'm going to teach in this course can improve in a standard work week for a professional chef. It's not ready yet, but it's coming soon. I promise. Thank you for being patient. All right, Kelvin asks, hey, Justin, you're my favorite small YouTube creator. Thank you so much. My question is, I'm a 26-year-old student finishing up my finance degree this December, but I've recently realized that my passion is cooking and I've thought about going to culinary school and starting over. I've had a lot of trouble in my life finding direction for what I want to do. Do you think going to culinary school is worth it for someone in their mid to late 20s? I've been in this industry coming up on 12 years next year. I just turned 29 and I feel like I have decades left in this industry. What is your timeline? And I think that that's a very important thing to think about. If the structure of culinary school, and it's not going to put you back too much financially, is actually going to catapult you into getting progress faster, I say why not? But it's funny, my advice for someone who's 26 versus someone who's 17 is more or less the same. I actually always admired the people in my culinary school who were a little bit older because they were much more organized and disciplined with getting their, you know, paperwork, their homework done. They also had much less ego coming into the kitchen. They paid more attention. They felt like they were at more of a peer level with the instructors, so they usually got their questions answered more. And plus, you're not in that stage of your life where you're constantly wanting to go out and party and do all that stuff, so you might be more more focused and get more value out of a culinary school experience. That being said, if you're really thinking about having this be a serious thing, why not go stage for a little bit and then you can see if this is a career worth transitioning into before you kind of make that leap. Jayziness asks, what was your wedding menu? And I have it pulled up here so I can read it. And the context I'll give my audience for this menu was my family and Anna's family. We're kind of like more Midwest people. So it was a lot of like a meat and potatoes crowd. But at the same time, I was cooking for our wedding because it was during COVID times. And so we didn't want to have any extra contact contracts uh, with vendors that we, you know, would have had to have 
canceled because of some sort of government mandate or something like that. We just didn't want extra people in the kind of like house that we rented for our wedding. And so I needed it to be something that was very like set it and forget it from the sense of like I could do a lot of prep beforehand. I could change it in my suit and then I could kind of like do the wedding thing and then change out of my suit and then do dinner for everybody. So that's the context. So I did the thing that I've always wanted to do, which is I bought a whole big prime rib and kind of filleted it all the way open, took all the connective tissue out and then I trussed it back up and then I did a herb crust on the outside after everything was cooked. I did a tender leek and then a bunch of sides, right? So I did tender leeks with Parmesan. I did chimichurri glazed roasted potatoes. I did citrus glazed carrots. I did shiitake mushrooms with chives. I think I did those as like a confit style. So I like salted them uh, and put a bunch of garlic in there and then I cooked them really low and slow in oil. Uh, and then I just finished those with chives. I did a romaine and spinach salad with radishes and dill buttermilk dressing. And then I did a horseradish creme fraiche for the prime rib. Question from Blood Brethren Games. What realistic change would you like to see in the legislative world so that the hospitality industry can survive this pandemic? This is really hard because I'm just one guy. This is not my battle. I don't have any grander say in the whole thing and I don't want to contribute to the people who are just pontificating about things that, you know, it, it would be great if some, I'll call it issues I'm seeing that aren't necessarily helping with the problem is like, we need to have more representation on people who understand the business model of a restaurant because, you know, being able to allow takeout but not alcohol service is a little bit difficult when prices, you know, don't really match with that because the check average, you know, breaks down very differently depending on the place. Second off, I think being able to draw parallels to other, you know, industries that are allowed to either open or gather in specific ways. I'm of course talking about the, you know, footage out of California of that person who had to close down their outdoor patio, but then there was a movie that was being shot just next door. Stuff like that is a little bit shady and doesn't make sense to me. And then the one that we're directly kind of dealing with is like loan structures and how, you know, certain bailouts of certain sectors based on how you spend the money that the government is using to help help you out. I think that that's very helpful. This is a quick one, but it's not often linked in a convenient place. So I'm going to put it up in the I card. The question comes from Mesner21, how to start working in good restaurants and how to convince chefs to hire me. I have two videos on that. One is about an email template that you can use to get stages, which is kind of like a working interview. And then the second one is more about like coming up with that list of restaurants, because I think that people approach this too arbitrarily. You should do it very strategically. You should have your list of 10 to 15 to 20 restaurants that tick the box of like, yeah, I like, I kind of like what they're doing. You don't know yet because you've never worked in those kitchens before, but the interest, the nugget of interest has to be there to start. And then you can kind of build from there as far as like you do a stage. Oh my goodness. My skills are so under leveled. This place is so far out of my league. Okay. Well now you can identify which skills you're lacking in and then improve in those. Doing it methodically versus sporadically can fast track your results. Question from Noah Trinidad. What advice do you have for picking up your first knife set? I was never the type of person who wanted the kind of like every handle has to be the same, the blade has to be the same steel on every single one because I know that knives are used for different purposes. I'm gonna pull on a thread from photography that I learned and you're gonna see how this applies to chefs. So when you're picking out what type of lens you want for your camera, there's you know 18 millimeters, 24 millimeters, 35, 55, 85 millimeter lenses, and it can all seem very daunting when you're starting. And knives can definitely be the same. There's a bunch of different millimeter lengths and blade profiles and stuff like that. And the advice that's given in the photography sector is to go in your Lightroom, your you know place where you store all your photos, and turn on the selector that shows you what photo photo focal length you took different photos with. You can then pick which ones were my favorite photos. And after a certain amount of time, if you've taken enough photos, you can see, I really like the way that 24 millimeter focal length looks in photos. Do the same with your knives. If you were to have to pit, build out a three knife kit, and those are the only three knives you could bring to work next week. What would be in that kit? And then figure out, okay, that's my knife set. And then you can upgrade those individual knives specifically, or look on, you know, like Corin.com has a great uh, tag on their page where you can pick out knife sets. Is there a knife set that already exists where everything looks the same that ticks those boxes? It has the paring knife, the petty knife, and the slicer, or it has the slicer, the chef knife, and the petty knife or it has the Nikiri, the slicer, and the paring knife. You know what I mean? Otherwise, if you're not in the headspace where you know exactly which knives you like to use, use my 20% rule video, and then you can kind of get some testing under your belt. 
And the last question for this Ask JK episode comes from Casper Hillman, who asks, I really want to become a chef, but I have no experience whatsoever. What's the first step I should take to fulfill my dream? Step one, be signed up to hear about the Demi Skills course, because I really hope that that helps people get a solid foundational knowledge that will translate to different kitchens. And step number two, something I had to do before I was even let into my culinary school is get some time in a restaurant. There's no shortage of people who are amazing at cooking for parties or amazing at cooking for their families and friends and everybody just jumps to this conclusion of you should be a chef. There's a lot of stuff that comes with this industry that is not so glamorous and is not so nice. And you have to like that stuff too, to an extent. And I know I constantly bring up stages, but what a low stakes way to get your foot in the door. And the beauty of your goals is that you don't necessarily, you're not saying to me, I need to upgrade to a Michelin star restaurant. I need, I need to be in fine dining. You're more saying, I want to see if being a chef is right for me. And so being able to approach either the place that you got, you frequent in your local town and being able to say, Hey, do you need help with prep on the weekends? Uh, when you guys are really, really busy, I'd be happy to come in and, you know, work a couple hours on Saturday. Saturday. I'll also hearken back to my networking example where you're already doing the piece of asking chefs if they like the industry, what aspects and advice they would give you. Looking into the comments too, it looks like you're in Sweden and you don't have that many restaurants to choose from. I'm just going to echo what D. Oshman, da Oshman says. Uh, don't be picky with where you work or what you're doing. Just show with genuine enthusiasm and interest and eventually you're so, you'll start moving up. I hope that helps some of you. Thank you so much again for watching this episode of Ask JK. Please leave your comments down below if you want to kind of like elaborate on things that I already said or you want to give additional advice that you think would be helpful. A couple of quick shameless plugs. If you haven't joined the community yet, that's something that is live. It's just five bucks a month and it's growing every single week and the discussions that are starting to form are getting me really excited. Also, if you're not on my email newsletter yet, you can sign up for that in the description below. It's called the 8020 Edge. I've also been dropping some spoons, silver spoons on the site every single week to people that are signed up to that newsletter. So if you want to hear about those first and help support the content, uh, that's how they're kind of priced. I would definitely recommend being signed up down below. Until next time when we host a Q&A like this, thank you so much for watching. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you folks have a good one.